then you understand that worship is coextensive with life. It is a moment by moment expression, not just in a punctilio or a momentary sense. It takes you every moment. Have you seen the movie Chariots of Fire years ago? It's the true story of two runners, Harold Abrams, who ran for personal glory, Eric Little, the Scottish runner, who ran for the glory of God. In the early part of the movie, Harold Abrams is being asked by a friend, Montague, Harold Abrams, cocky, sure, confident, and Montague looks at him and says, I hate losing, Harold, how about you? He says, I don't know, I have never lost. Towards the end of the movie, Harold Abrams is being massaged before this great run of his, and I think it was the 1924 Olympics in Paris. And Harold Abrams is getting ready, and Montague's already run and already lost. And Eric Little had not run on his key event because the heats were going to be on the Lord's Day. He changed his event and was going to run in the 400 meters as a change so that he could live with his conviction, which he was not foisting on anyone else, but in his mind, he did not want to abuse the Lord's Day and he kept that as a firm principle. Earlier on, Harold Abrams and he had competed in the event. The movie doesn't show that and actually he beat Abrams in the event that they did ran, the 200 meters. They were pitting themselves against each other. But now Abrams is about to run the 100 meters. Little is not running in it. And Montague looks at him and he asks him if he's ready. You know what he says? He says, you know Montague, I used to be afraid to lose. But now I'm afraid to win because I have 10 seconds in which to prove the reason for my existence and even then I'm not sure I will. He ran the 100, he won it, went out in despondency, he reached the climactic goal of pleasure in his life, it ultimately let him down. He had nothing left to celebrate, there was a downer after even his victory. Little. His sister said to him, Eric, you're giving up so much. He says, why are you giving up so much for this? And he put his hands gently on her shoulders. He says, Jenny, 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 God has made me for a purpose, but he's also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. When he started to run the 400 meters, the American athlete Jackson Schultz walked over to him and gave him a piece of paper. And Eric opened it just before the gun was sounded and it said, Them that honor me will I also honor, says the Lord. Eric clasped that piece of paper and breasted that tape as a winner. Eric ran with his hands flailing, looking to the heavens, to him. Even his running was an expression of worship to God. Whatever you do, you may work in a computer, you may be a ditch digger, you may work in a cemetery, you may be the executive of a corporation, you may be a homemaker, you may be a student. Do all to the glory of God and give that as an expression of worship to Him. My father-in-law passed away a few years ago at the age of 85. And I remember sitting across the table from him and uh, he said, I'm afraid to die so soon, son, because I didn't have the time to provide enough for Mama. He was referring to his wife. I said, Dad, you have? He said, no, I haven't. I said, you have? He said, how do you know? I have. I said, I've talked to your accountant. <laughs> for the first time, I saw my father-in-law stymied. I said, we've been looking into all of that, Dad. From diagnosis to death, it took him four months. He thought he had been moving some bookcases, pain in the back, turned out to be a tumor. Four months later, he was gone. I said, Dad, don't worry. And I said, I tell you what, even if you hadn't provided, we're there. Why are you worried about this? He said, he was a World War II veteran, you know, Royal Canadian Air Force. He said, son, it was my responsibility. I said, and if you feel you could not fulfill it, we will, because of our love for you. Don't be fearful. He went into a period of silence for a few days. I had gone to speak somewhere. His three of his four daughters were around him. And I thought I would make it back, but we'd all in some ways said our goodbyes, but I didn't want to be back. I missed it by about an hour. And his three daughters standing around him and his wife, and my wife said after these days of silence, he opened his eyes, he looked to the heavens, and he said, Amazing. 
That's amazing. And then he looked at his wife of 63 years and said, Jean, I love you. What a way to say goodbye to this world. Coach Lou Little, coached a young football player who never made it to the first string. He was always the second stringer. Little liked him, but he was not the best. Invariably, Little would tell in his story, but in his book, he would see this young man walking through the college grounds with his father's arm in his, showing him that the young lad was showing around the buildings. But he was always describing something. He said, I felt I was intruding into that, so I never went to talk to them. He said, one day the young lad came to me and said, Coach, I'm not going to be here for tomorrow's game. I have to go for my father's funeral. He passed away. The coach said, it's okay. We'll wait for you to come back. So he had to go for his father's funeral. He came back a few days later. He said, Coach, I've never asked you to do this. Please let me play next week's game. He said, I can't displace somebody who's playing better than you. He said, I agree. Give me just a few minutes on that field, and if I'm not that best player out there, you bench me. He said, okay. He put him out there. He played his heart out as one of the best players on that team. So that even the man he replaced said, you made the right decision, coach. You need to play him. And as they were walking away, the coach put his arm around him and said, what got into you? Was this because of your father's passing? He said, but a little more than that. He said, coach, my dad was blind. Today is the first day he was going to see me play. I was invited to, to Louisiana to uh, visit a prison. So you may have heard me mention it on the air because it was so overwhelming. It is called the Angola prison. There are over 5,000 prisoners, 5,300 prisoners in Angola prison, 85% of whom are on life without parole. 45 of them on death row. It used to be the bloodiest prison in the country. Blood on the walls, blood on the ceiling, blood on the carpets, and this amply built man by the name of Burl Kane with the girth of a southern sheriff. He comes over and says, I'll take this job as warden if you let me do it my way. And they brought him on. He puts Bible verses all over the prison. He has Bible studies every day. He's got a degree program going on there for theology. 90 prisoners are now registered. Former gangsters, now they're gangs of pastors. When you, when you, used, when you used to check into Angola, they used to give you a knife to protect yourself. No more. You know what they told me? You can take the loveliest looking young woman and walk her past any one of the cells. You won't hear a profane word. You won't hear a cat call. You won't hear a whistle. Profanity is not allowed in this prison by either staff or inmate. It has become one of the safest prisons in the country. And as I walked past death row cell to cell shaking hands, some of them had my book, some of them had John Piper, some of them had R.C. Sproul's, and every one of them had a Bible in the cell. An experience I never had before. I walked into the execution chamber. Pretty daunting. Pretty daunting. In fact, I told the chaplain there, I said, I'd like to bring my whole team here. Because I think you stare death at death in a way you never stare at anywhere else. And I sat at the table where they have their last meal before they're taken to be executed. And as I sat on that chair, I began to wonder what must go on through the emotions of a man. And I looked at the wall, it's a painting. It's a painting of Daniel in the lion's den on his knees. I said, who painted that? He said, one of the prisoners. He painted it to say, God can still rescue you. And I said, and what if he doesn't then? So look at the other wall. There's a picture of Elijah rising to the heavens on chariots of fire. If he doesn't rescue you this way, he'll rescue you that way. It's a story of a rich man with a lot of jewels and a lot of money in his pockets. And he's taking a long journey. And as he is beginning this journey, a thief begins to follow him. 
and the thief has set his sight upon all of this, these goodies. And the story in India, in Hindi, is called "Dhan Tumare Pas Hai." I'll tell you what it means. But it says "Dhan Tumare Pas Hai," and the thief is following this man, and the man knows what he's up to. So every time they check into a room, the thief checks into the same room. They spread out the mats, spread out the pillows, and the rich man is sharp. He knows what this fellow is up to all the time. So what he says is this: to the, as soon as they check into the room, in the end, he says, "Why don't you go and get washed up for the night?" And after you get washed up, use a tap and come back. Then I'll go there. So the thief says, "All right," knowing he'll have the time alone while the rich man is getting his nightly ablutions there. So the thief goes out, and the rich man, as soon as the thief steps out, takes all of his precious stones and money and puts it under the pillow of the thief. <laughs> And then the thief comes back, and the rich man goes to get washed up. And the thief is rummaging through the bags of the rich man. He's rummaging under the pillow of the rich man. He's looking at every piece of garment the rich man has to see where he's hidden it, and he can't find it. Night after night after night, he's looked everywhere except under his own pillow, with that uneasy head wondering, "What is this boy up to?" And the last night, as they're about to part, the rich man looks at him and says, "I know what you've been trying to do." He says, "You know what your problem is." You didn't know a very simple truth in life. Dhan, tumare pas hai. The wealth was nearer to you than you realized. He has made you for himself, and your heart is restless until you find its rest in him. Be yourself. Be what God has made you to be. Do you know the word individual comes from the Latin that which cannot be divided? You present an individuality of different components that is unique to you. Your greatest pursuit and my greatest pursuit should be to find out what God wants us to be as individuals, not to try to be someone else. Please be yourself. Quit trying to yearn to imitate someone else.